Okay, so no offense to people that like to fish, but we can say that narcissists are very much like fishermen in the sense that just like a fisherman will change bait in order to catch their fish, narcissists will change whatever manipulation tactic they are using so as to be successful in their manipulation. And so today we're gonna dive into their toolbox and pull out the manipulation tool of triangulation. Now, narcissists love to use this tool with the goal to divide and conquer, which when we look through history, this has been a very successful tactic. For example, causing division is nothing new. It's not a new strategy. It's been known to break apart civilizations. Just think about the Roman Empire. One of the main reasons that it fell was due to the divisions that were created internally. So the power of causing divisions has been around for a long time. So bottom line, causing divisions is a powerful strategy that can create tremendous destruction from civilizations to families, to the internal destruction of your self-esteem or your self-worth. And narcissists know this. And so one of the ways that they achieve causing divisions is with this tool of triangulation. So let's break it down. In this video, I wanna talk about what is triangulation. I wanna give you some examples of different scenarios where you might be able to notice it, especially when it comes to covert narcissists. It can be so subtle. We really have to understand what it looks like. And then last but not least, if you feel like you're a victim of this emotional manipulation, then you're gonna to wanna to watch to the end because I'm gonna give you some tips that can help. So let's dive in. For those that don't know me, my name is Michelle. I'm a survivor myself of narcissistic abuse. I'm now a trauma-informed coach. I'm a somatic experiencing practitioner, and I'm the founder of the School of Transformation, where survivors of emotional trauma for whatever reason, whether it's any form of abuse or neglect, meet live weekly on Zoom, and we do the inner healing work together. There is currently a seven-day free trial available, so I'll leave the link here for you so that you can check it out and see if it's a good resource for you. So we know with covert narcissists, they love to be the typical wolf in sheep's clothing. They love playing the victim. In fact, they can make a whole career out of it. But the bottom line is that nothing is ever their fault. And so triangulation is a way that allows them to stay in that victim role. So this is the triangulation game board of the covert narcissist. There are three roles. There's the victim, persecutor, and rescuer. Now, the narcissist loves to be in either the victim or rescuer role, depending on what strategy they're using, when in reality, they are hiding the fact that they are the persecutor all the time. So let's talk about that. So when the narcissist is playing the victim, they need someone else on their game board to be in the role of persecutor. And the person that's in the persecutor role is the person that the narcissist is talking bad about or targeting in some way, shape, or form. And so the person they are talking to about the other person is in the role of rescuer. They're hoping this person sympathizes with them, teams up with them against the supposed persecutor. Sometimes, however, the narcissist will put the person that they're trying to get to side with them in the role of victim and themselves in the rescuer role. And so again, they're trying to create an alliance with this other person, trying to make this other person feel like they're looking out for them. This person is a, is a victim and they're gonna rescue them from this horrible persecutor or the outside or third person. Either way, this is their game board and their goal is to get you to somehow get onto the drama triangle. And their favorite way to do that is to provoke you to react so that they can point the finger and make you look like the persecutor. So let's talk about what this might look like if you are being sucked in by somebody that might be high in the scale of malignant narcissism against somebody else and accidentally being pulled into this drama triangle. What that might look like is this person that's pulling you into the drama triangle that's talking about someone else negatively is trying to get you to take sides on a specific issue. The problem might be between them and another coworker, between them and another family member, but there is this pressure for you to take sides on the matter. 
it's not just sharing and talking about the problem, but there's almost this thought behind it that now that you know, you have to be on their side. Another way that you might get sucked into a drama triangle accidentally is when somebody is trying to make you the one that gets to choose who's right and who's wrong. And it's usually somebody that really should not be in that role. For example, it might be two parents arguing, pulling in a child as that third part of that triangle to choose who's right and who's wrong. And then another way that you might accidentally get sucked into a drama triangle is by means of gossiping. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Those are ways the narcissist tries to put you in the rescuer role of that drama triangle. Now let's switch into ways that you may accidentally be getting sucked into the drama triangle by having somebody put you in the persecutor role. So what that might look like is that you're in a dynamic where there's three people. It might be family members, it might be coworkers, it might be a friend group, but suddenly in this group of three, you feel like you're constantly being excluded. It could be that every time you're together with these other two friends, suddenly it's as if you are invisible. You're being ignored completely. And yet when you bring it up, you're treated as if you're jealous or problematic. Another way that the malignant narcissist can try to shove and force you to be on that persecutor role is by treating you very unkind and disrespectfully when nobody is looking. And yet every time when you go out, they completely change how they treat you, but you don't even notice because you're so still shell-shocked from how they were right before other people were around that you're not yourself, right? And so everyone's looking at this dynamic and they're like, but look at how wonderful so-and-so is and look at how messed up the other person looks. Nobody's noticing these little things that the narcissist can do when nobody's looking. So basically they're creating chaos and then pointing the finger at your reactions, your normal reactions to abnormal relationship patterns as if that or you are the problem. So let's shift a little bit into why do narcissists do this? What is their motive? And I'm not gonna lie, when we really dissect these behaviors and their motives, it can be ugly because when we come face to face with why certain people do this, especially if they're high on the scale of NPD, it's not easy to wrap your head around and it's a hard pill to swallow. So just throwing that out there. The ultimate goals that narcissists have when they're using triangulation is one, they want to turn people against each other. They like to be the one that controls the narrative. So if there are problems between these people, they're not speaking. And so the only narrative that's being told to either party comes from the narcissist. So that's one of their goals, but that's not their only goal. So since one of the common ways that they triangulate is through indirect communication, their motive is to gain advantage over their rivals, their partners, their family members by manipulating them into conflict to either create drama or to feel some kind of one-upmanship. So yes, this is one of those hard truths to swallow. Not only are they wanting to create drama, but at the same time, they wanna make you look crazy by trying to point out to the other person what you're noticing and the other person isn't. So it makes you feel so crazy, so gaslit, and so confused. And the reason they do that has to do with their need for positive and negative supply, which we're gonna get to soon. But before we do so, I wanna really first uncover the most sinister motive that's behind triangulation. Underneath their need for drama, their desire to cause divisions, their desire to make you look crazy is the real reason that they create triangulation. And that has to do with their need to hide the real problem, the real issue, which is usually that the toxic person is either crossing boundaries of someone, lying, manipulating, gaslighting, lacking respect for someone, being highly critical or negative, or has an insatiable need or appetite for attention and control. These unhealthy relationship patterns, they're the real problem that the narcissist does not want to face. 
because the narcissist does not like to self-reflect. They don't like to feel as if they need to work on anything because their ego and false image won't let them see that they are just as human as anyone else and that they too have flaws that need attention. But rather than seeing that and being willing to do personal development, they prefer to use manipulation tactics like triangulation so that there's so much confusion that the real problem, their real behavioral problems go unseen by the emotionally inexperienced parties and the blame gets carried by somebody else. Now that we know the why behind what they do, let's shift into three scenarios where you might notice this. And we're going to go to the three areas of our life that are most important. We're going to go to work, family, and friends. So in the work environment, when a narcissist is wanting to one up you, this can often show up when a narcissist will love bomb a supervisor or somebody in a position of authority and will slowly poison that person's perception of you. And now the crazy thing is, is that it doesn't feel like they're smearing your name the way the narcissist does it. They might say things like, you know, I really think so-and-so is a great worker. You know, I'm really happy to be on so-and-so's team, but smear, 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 but I'm really appreciative of, you know, learning a lot from this person. And so because they smear by saying positive and tossing in just a little bit of negativity, that causes people to believe them because they're not being so negative, right? And they don't look problematic. But when the innocent party hears about it, they can often react, and rightly so, in a very upset way. And unfortunately, that's then pointed out as you being the problem. I will say this, in a work environment, it doesn't always just have to do with the boss or climbing up the ladder by stepping on you. Sometimes it's just about being more liked and believed, right? So it can be among your coworkers. In other words, covert narcissists are okay with cutting off their nose to spite their face. In other words, they're okay with doing things that in the long run are not great for them but in the moment, allow them to be more liked and more noticed by others. I've had clients talk about different work scenarios where the narcissist will set them up before a meeting where they'll have, they'll be saying things that don't make sense, saying things to cause a reaction. But when they get to the meeting, they're, they're not talking about those things. They're completely calm and reasonable, but the person that they were talking to prior to the meeting is all riled up now. They've just set that person up to look bad and there's their way of, maybe they feel inferior to that other coworker, but by setting them, them up like that, they reestablish the balance of I'm here and that person is there. Moving on to more personal relationships, like our family. Let's talk about what triangulation looks like. If you're learning about covert narcissists, you're probably familiar with the terms scapegoat and golden child. This is a form of triangulation where a narcissistic parent basically splits their own personality in half and projects all that they like onto the golden child where that golden child can do no wrong and all that they don't like in themselves gets projected onto the one they force into the role of scapegoat. Whenever you hear scapegoats and golden children describing their childhood, it sounds like they're two people that lived in completely different environments, yet they lived under the same roof. For example, how amazing and great the parent is through the eyes of the golden child sounds foreign to the scapegoat and the abuse neglect criticism that the scapegoat endured sounds foreign and as if it's made up and a lie to the golden child so there's a few reasons why they do this why they triangulate with their children. One of the reasons is they get to control the narrative about what's going on, but also they get validation from the golden child that they're not the problem, that it's the scapegoat that's causing all of the problems. It also allows them to get a tremendous amount of attention in a very maladaptive way. That dynamic of golden child and scapegoat can also be created between spouses. And what I mean by that is this is another dynamic that you might see triangulation in in a family unit where the narcissistic parent makes the children, whether there's one, three, five, or 10, all golden children, and their spouse becomes the scapegoat. 
Now, I had a client once tell me that she grew up in that dynamic from a very young age, the narcissistic parent who at that time she didn't realize was the one causing all of the problems was blaming the other parent all of the children bought into that reality and that story. They had a very estranged relationship at, even as she was growing up with both parents under the same roof. But after they divorced, she never really had a relationship with her mother until two years before her mother passed away. She was an adult and her mother was dying of cancer. And she said she got to know who her mother really was and she could not believe that she had fallen for all of the lies that had taken place as she was growing up. And so I bring up that dynamic because I've also worked with a lot of spouses in that situation where their children and the whole family was turned against them. There was no scapegoated child. And so it's confusing until they realized that they were placed on that drama triangle as the persecutor, as the one that was the problem, as the one that carried all of the blame and they themselves were the scapegoat. And so I just kind of want to bring up why narcissists do this in their family, because it can kind of make sense, not that you like it in a work environment, but it can make sense that somebody's trying to one up, somebody's trying to get ahead in a, an unhealthy way, right? But why do this in the family? Well, the reason is twofold. One being that they're trying to hide the real problem, that the covert narcissist has unhealthy behavior patterns. They're selfish, they're entitled, they disrespect boundaries, they have a lack of empathy. They're not willing to self-reflect. They're not willing to take accountability. And so that's there and it's causing problems. Well, what do you do when you're causing problems that you don't want to work on, but yet you're not willing to work on yourself to bring about changes? Well, you triangulate somebody else into being blamed for the problems. So it hides the real problem. And I want to add that it also allows the narcissist to get double supply, both positive and negative supply. They get the positive supply from the children that are fooled into thinking that the narcissistic parent, the one causing all the problems, isn't the victim and that the other parent is the problem. That's a tremendous amount of positive supply that they get. They also gain the attention, the validation, the admiration that they desperately need in order to build up their fragile sense of self-worth and to keep their own toxic shame deeply hidden. And the children that are falling for this false image wind up supporting and validating the false self that the covert narcissist pretends to be. Now that's a tremendous amount of positive supply. Now the spouse that's being manipulated, gaslit, set up to be reactive, rejected, treated as the blame for every single thing that goes wrong winds up providing negative narcissistic supply because the narcissist is intentionally provoking their significant other into emotional reactions that include fear, anger, resentment, helplessness, shame, doubt, insecurity. And the reason why narcissists opt for this route isn't just about attention, it's about control. Negative narcissistic supply makes them feel more in control and powerful, defending against the shame and helplessness that they feel deep down. And the last family dynamic when it comes to triangulation that I'm going to mention has to do with when either the scapegoat or the golden child grow up and start creating their own family systems. The narcissistic parent can triangulate either the, the scapegoat's significant other or the golden child's significant other. They just do it differently. For example, with the golden child's spouse or significant other, the narcissist will often make the spouse the scapegoat and have that alliance with the golden child. And so how they triangulate is they will strategically misbehave, be unkind, rude, unloving, behind the golden child's back. So the golden child is never a witness to this bad behavior of their narcissistic parent because they will seemingly flip into this nice person when the golden child is around. Now this makes their spouse look crazy, paranoid, or oversensitive. And the goal of the narcissist, again, is to form that alliance with their child versus the scapegoated spouse of their child. In this way, they get the positive supply from their golden child and negative supply from their golden child's spouse. They triangulate 
completely opposite with their scapegoated child. The scapegoat's significant other, and I know this is like, I'm already getting a headache, but the scapegoat's significant other winds up being treated really well all the time. And so what happens is the scapegoated child stays the scapegoat their significant other sees a whole different version of their parent to the point that the significant other starts looking at their sig- their spouse, right? The scapegoated child, like, what's wrong with you? Like, your parent's amazing. There must be something wrong with you. You're too sensitive. And so now inadvertently, the narcissistic parent has triangulated and formed an alliance with their scapegoat's significant other further isolating and invalidating their already abused child. They're once again creating both positive and negative supply through the relationship of the child and their spouse. This honestly has my head spinning right now and I have not even finished my list. I have not gotten to the the last dynamics that I wanted to mention, which is when you enter a friend group and there's a malignant covert narcissist, that winds up making you the scapegoat. Now, I think for the sake of time, I'm gonna have to have a part B to this video. So I will put in what happens when you go into a friend group and there's a malignant narcissist, how they use triangulation, and then I will give you some tips on how you can break free of this manipulation tactic. And again, if you've been watching videos like this and you've been learning tips and yet still feel like you just can't break free from the suffering of narcissistic abuse, I wanna invite you to my live Zoom meetings that I have every week I meet with people from all over the world that are healing from childhood trauma, from CPTSD, from narcissistic abuse. We meet live on Zoom every week. There is currently a seven day free trial. So if you resonate with my videos and you wanna join me live, I'll leave the link here for you. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon for when you're notified of my next video, which will be a continuation of this one.